Okay, everybody. Um, in this class session, we're going to be talking about interviews. Um, a lot of you will be interviewing soon, in fact, for some jobs or internships that you've applied for. Uh, we're going to talk about preparing for interviews, specifically doing your research and preparing things called PAR stories. Uh, we're going to talk about how to be yourself in an interview, why that's so important, and then finally what you should do after every interview. Let's talk for a little bit about preparation. The most important thing you can do for any interview is research. Do your research on the company and on the job before you head into the interview. Um, I've always been kind of fascinated by the Ironman Triathlon in Hawaii every year, the World Championship Triathlon. Every time I watch a you know a show about that, it seems like they always say that the if you're not familiar with the race, it's basically about two and a half miles of swimming, over a hundred miles of bike riding, and then a marathon or twenty six miles of running. And what's interesting about this is that it seems like every time I watch the Ironman for that year, um, the announcer says something about the swim. They always say you can you can lose the Ironman in the swim, but you can't win it. No matter how good you are at the swim, you're not going to win by swimming faster than everybody. But if you swim a lot slower, you're definitely going to lose the Ironman. And that's how it works with this. Um, probably not going to get a job because you wowed the interviewer with all the research you've done on the company or the agency. But uh, if you don't do your research, then you'll definitely not get the job. And the reason is because it shows that you don't care enough. If you don't care enough to spend some time learning basic, important information, then uh, there's no reason for them to want to hire you. So at a minimum, do your research. I'd encourage you to do your research in the following ways. First, get on the phone and talk to people who work there. Um, the phone is, a lot, is underused these days because of the power of Google. We think we can find things because they're on the internet. Nothing replaces a phone conversation with somebody at the organization. In fact, that's one of the best ways to get information. It should be your default when you're doing research before an interview is your default question is, is there anybody there that I can call and talk to? And if not, how do I find out someone's information to call them? Um, you'll learn a lot more and get a lot more insight than you'll ever find on the internet. But the internet's not totally useless. I encourage you to get on LinkedIn to learn about the people that are interviewing you and meeting you while you're in the interview process. Um, remember, these are people making these choices, not just an organization. It doesn't. It's not enough to do research just on the the nonprofit or the government agency. You also need to do research about the individuals that will be interviewing you because those are the people who will be making the decision, not some company. It's going to be people that decide to hire you. So learn more about them before you meet them. <clears throat> it might feel like stalking, but um, but it, it's uh, actually, I think, a common practice. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, finally, that's when you, and last, get on the organization's website or search Google to find three kinds of things. Look for recent news about the organization. Look for any changes that have occurred recently, and then any achievements. These will be top of mind uh, subjects for the people doing the interviewing, and so it's an easy, it's the easiest way for you to relate with them. Uh, you know, just talking about the same thing that they've been doing for the last twenty years is not going to be as important or interesting to them as talking about recent things like changes or achievements. So. So uh, you've done this research. Now you need to prepare for the types of questions you might encounter. It's important to spend time rehearsing answers to specific sorts of questions. Um, you know, employers like to know specific things about you. They're not just there to get to know you generally. One of the best ways to prepare for specific types of questions is to plan out what are called PAR stories. And you're going to actually have to do this. You're going to have to prepare some PAR stories and turn them into me. Essentially, what a, the, the acronym PAR stands for Problem, Action, and Resolution. And this is a way you can demonstrate your skills with a real example rather than talking about yourself in generalities. Generalities don't cut it. If you just tell somebody, well, I'm a creative person, it's not the same as showing your creativity through what you've accomplished. And PAR story is a way that you demonstrate what you've accomplished in the context of a certain attribute or skill or whatever it is that they're looking for. So let me give you an example. 
um, first off, there's a, a problem, right? And you say, well, in my last agency, we had three times the participants sign up than in the previous year. So there's high pressure demand, and what do you, what did you do about it? The action part is where you describe that, and you, in this case, it'd be I created a distance learning program as an alternative to the on-site classes. Recognizing that you could do some stuff online, you took advantage of those resources. And then the resolution. By the time, by the same time a year later, we enrolled a thousand students, five times our previous enrollment. Uh, notice that there's an emphasis there on numbers, which is one of the best ways to show results. And so <clears throat> emphasizing PAR stories is a great way to answer questions because it gives people context and allows you to, to uh, describe your attributes in relation to your accomplishments. And that's those are sort of the most compelling stories or examples people can have when they're making decisions about you. PAR stores only work if you understand why they're asking the question. Uh, I'm going to run through a bunch of questions, and I want you to... Um, I want you to kind of think of why they're asking this question. I'll tell you the reasons I think. So these are really typical interview questions. Um, my least favorite one, tell me about yourself. Uh, this is such, a, such an open-ended question, and every single time I hear this in an interview, the person on the other end says, uh, well, let's see, where do I begin? Like they never know what to start, be, where to start because they don't understand why the question is being asked. The question that's actually being asked, I think, when people say, tell me about yourself, is what's important to you? And that's where you should start when you ask this question. Think about the things ahead of time that are most important to you. So when they ask this question, which is almost inevitable these days, you can start off with what's important to you. So <clears throat> when somebody says, tell me about yourself, you know, don't give them a bio. Tell them about, just pick and choose the things that are most interesting or important to you. Say, say things like, well, you know, I graduated from an MPA program, which I loved because dot, dot, dot. Um, those sorts of answers mean a lot more to the interviewer because you're explaining what's important to you. Here's another one. Where do you picture yourself in five years? Um, you know, this question is not intended to assess your predictive, your prophetic capacities. We're not trying to tell whether or not you can predict the future. What we're actually doing is wondering how ambitious are you? Like what is it, what sorts of goals have you set for yourself? What do you want to accomplish? And what plans do you have to accomplish those things? That's the question is how ambitious are you? Here's another one. Tell me about a time you had to resolve a conflict at work. Tell me about a time you had to dot, 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 whatever. I mean, it doesn't matter. There are, this is where they invite par stories, and so it's good to have these prepared. Um, they're looking for attributes. They want to know how creative you are, how patient you are, how thoughtful you are, how hardworking you are. And so when they ask questions like this, they're inviting you to share a par story to illustrate one of your attributes. And so this, these ones it should be easy for you, quite frankly, because they're the sorts of things you can. These are the sort of questions you can prepare for very easily. Here's one: Why do you want to work here? Um, you know, this is a difficult question, especially when some of you are still trying to figure out what you want to do in life. Uh, this question kind of gets to the heart of your insecurities. <laughs> and so it's a hard question to answer, frankly. But the reality is they're not asking that question. The question they're really asking is, will you enjoy this job? Th they need to know that because if you're not going to enjoy the job, they're going to have to hire a replacement for you in the near future because you're going to leave or they're going to fire you. And neither of those are attractive options to them. And so what they really want to know is, will you enjoy this job? So when they ask you, why do you want to work here, focus on the things about the job that you would enjoy and, and, and give that as your answer because that's what they really want to know. Okay, so those are sort of the standard questions. Let's get into some of the weird ones or the uncomfortable ones like, what's your biggest weakness? Uh, I hate this question. I think it's, I think it's inappropriate and, and doesn't fit well in an interview, but you're going to be asked this probably at some point. Um, really, the reason they're asking this question is because they want to know how self-aware you are. So you need to, so that's what your answer needs to pr provide. You need to illustrate self-awareness. Uh, what they don't want is somebody who is totally oblivious to their weaknesses. And if you can simply, you, it, you can, you just need to demonstrate that you understand that you're not perfect and that you have ways to improve. 
Uh, be careful in the way you answer this question, though. For example, if you have to, if this is a job where you need to always arrive earlier on time, don't say, "Well, I have a problem sleeping in." That's obviously not the best answer to this question. That's a that's actually demonstrating a lack of self awareness, because you're not self aware enough to know that you're you're highlighting a weakness that directly contradicts the requirements of the job. But again, it's all about self awareness. Um, here's another weird one. What kind of animal would you be and why? Now, the reason interviewers ask this question is because they want to see what happens when you're in an unsettled situation. They want to see, first, how creative you are, but also how comfortable you are. They want to know how well you manage socially awkward situations. And and also, if, you're, if you see yourself as kind of self-important or if you see yourself as comfortable in, in, in awkward situations like this. So remember, if that's what they're asking or, or some other weird question like this, that's what they're going for is creativity and comfort in awkward situations. You might get a question like this. How many windows are in New York City? Obviously, you have no reason to know that, but that they're not asking for the right answer. What they're actually looking for is how do you solve problems? They want to understand the way you go about solving problems because it's probably a job that involves a lot of problem solving and they're looking for wisdom and insight and pragmatism, not um, a correct answer per se. And so as you answer a question like this, don't say something like, uh, I don't know, a million? Because that shows that you don't really care about problem solving. You're not curious about problem solving either. and You don't enjoy problem solving. You want to give them an answer that shows that you enjoy this kind of thing. So you'd say, oh, wow, that's really interesting. Okay, let's see. Well, you know, there, there, you know, if we look up on the Internet, we probably find how long the island, how many square feet the island of Manhattan is. And we could sort of estimate how many buildings there are in that. And then the average height of a building and then how many. And you, the point is you could get dig in to this describing how you would find the answer and showing an enthusiasm and curiosity for problem solving, because that's really what they want to know. And then, you know, sometimes you're going to get really weird questions in interviews, like, what do you think of these jokers in Congress? You know, questions like this that are inappropriate, um, questions like about family, about uh, about uh, your age, about, uh, you know, any, anything that's sort of taboo, your, your religious faith, for example. The reason they're asking this question is not because they enjoy breaking the law, when it comes to hiring, they're asking questions like this because they want to know how much are you like me? Um, it's important to a lot of employers. They, they want to work with people that they're comfortable with, and that's what they're going for. And so if you get a really weird, oddball question like this, remember that's why they're asking it. And so focus on similarities. Focus on helping them understand how to relate to you because that's why they're asking the question. And that's a nice segue to the second uh, category that I wanted to talk about with this class session is this idea of being yourself. Being yourself is the hardest and yet the most important thing you can do in any interview. Um, being yourself is, the, is, is, the, is giving the interviewer exactly what they want. They don't want a false version of you. They don't want a puffed up fake version of you. They want the real you and being yourself is how they will be able to. And if you convey sincerity, genuineness in the interview, they will sense that they will feel that and they will be more likely to trust you in making the decision to hire you. Um, so if being yourself in an interview is hard, if you find, you know, in interactions, especially with strangers, that you have a hard time being comfortable in being yourself, here are three ideas that might help. The first one is to remember that interviewers are not trying to catch you making a mistake. They're just, they just want to get to know you better. They're not trying to trip you up. They just want to understand who you are. So be comfortable with that. They're not your enemy. Number two, if you're nervous, it's because probably because you're excited for the job. Turn your nervousness into enthusiasm. Think about how much you'd enjoy the job if you got it. Convey that enthusiasm. Now, you might worry about getting your hopes up, but in this case, it's okay. You should have the emotional strength to get your hopes up a little bit in an encounter like this. But if you're, but if you're feeling nervous, get in, dig into why you're nervous. It's probably because you're excited for the job. So focus on the excitement part, not on the, the thought of not getting the job. 
And then finally, you know, when you're interviewed, you're probably being interviewed by people who may become your friends someday. And then knowing that, you can think of them that way now. These people you're interviewing with may be people that you invite over to your house for dinner someday or people that you go to hang out with at the, at the, at the company barbecue, right? I mean, these are people that will someday become your friends if you get the job. So think about them that think about them as friends now. Now, don't be too familiar with them, obviously, in a way that might feel inappropriate, but feel comfortable in the way you'd feel comfortable around your friends, and it will help you be more genuine. You know, the reason it matters about being yourself is because there's one thing everybody notices first when they meet someone. They notice warmth first. Think about all the encounters you've ever had meeting someone. The very first thing you notice it, consciously or not, is how warm they are. And if they're warm and friendly, you're drawn to that. If they're cold or distanced, you, you, you don't appreciate that. And so warmth is one of the most important things you can have in an interview. Be thinking about them rather than about yourself, and th that will take you miles. Okay, let's wrap it up now with some advice for after every interview, what you should do. Now, this isn't going to be about, like, you know, how soon do I follow up with, you know, questions or any of that kind of stuff. This is going to be really simple. Uh, it's a story about the Rhodes Scholarship. Um, if you're not familiar with how that works, essentially this is a chance to – the Rhodes Scholarship is a really elite um, accomplishment. It's, a, it's an opportunity to study in England at Oxford University. That's Rhodes Hall where Rhodes Scholars meet. Um, it uh, is a very prestigious award. Um, there's a law professor at the law school named Brett Sharfs who was a Rhodes Scholar. In fact, he was one of the few Rhodes Scholars to ever come out of Utah. Because that's the case, he mentors students from BYU or from Utah generally who are applying for the Rhodes Scholarship. I was Professor Sharf's research assistant when I was in law school, and uh, he told me a story once that really stuck with me. He said that he, over the years, he had mentored about nine or ten students who were interested in the Rhodes Scholarship or were applying for the Rhodes Scholarship. All of these students were incredibly impressive. Um, the problem is not a single one of them got the, got the Rhodes Scholarship. So Professor Sharps would spend months with these students, giving them advice, helping them prepare. And then what's interesting, though, is that although not a single one of them ever got the Rhodes Scholarship, an unfortunate pattern, an, an, a different unfortunate pattern held true, which is that not a single one of them ever came back to Professor Sharps to say thank you. Not a single one. So of all these Rhodes Scholarship students or applicants, uh, not a single one ever came back and said, thank you for all the help you gave. Uh, you know, that's pretty terrible. I think one of the most important things you can do is say thank you for an encounter. These people have given you their time to consider you for a position, and at the very least, that deserves your thanks. You'll never regret saying thank you, and that's the most important thing to remember. In many cases, it will help you, and so I encourage you to take the time to send a personal note, at the very least send an email, um, in some way reach out to the person just to say, hey, thank you for your time. Uh, they'll always appreciate that. It, it, it's probably not very often going to be the difference between getting the job, but uh, it can't hurt. And you may find that it open doors for you. it will open doors for you in other ways, if, if not for that job specifically. Okay, so that's it. That's the discussion. Um, I do have an assignment for you for class. I want you to come to class with three unexpected questions. You can ask a person to get to know them better. We're going to be putting each other on the hot seat. And uh, so I want you to think of three questions that are unique ways to get to know a person better. Obviously, don't make them inappropriate. We have an honor code here at BYU, but um, I want, we're going to take some time asking each other these questions to see how well we can respond on our toes. So we'll see you all tomorrow.